Um, <clears throat> so we've been kind of talking about uh, in, in this discussion, we've had a couple of, of weeks of uh, break from our class, but uh, in this, this sort of ongoing discussion about, um, about why people leave and, and then maybe what we can start to do to, to, uh, to make a difference in, in that, to, to perhaps help um, keep those who we have influence over um, a, a part of the church and, and, and growing in faith and, you know, being the kind of community that, that is welcoming and is, um, and, and, and helps to, helps people to, to want to find a place to, to stay and to, uh, to work and to grow. Um, one of the things that's, that's kind of come up, uh, I'm perceiving is a little bit of a tension between, um, the, 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 the fact that as disciples of Jesus, we, we have to take following him seriously. You know, there are demands on the life of a, of a disciple of Christ. There are, are, are claims that Jesus make on, makes on us that, that, uh, that, are, that can be difficult uh, sometimes. Um, and, and, and so there's that. But then there's also this, this need that we're feeling kind of based on especially some of the, 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 the reasons that we've, we've looked at for people that, that people say they leave, um, we, we want to be welcoming. We want to be, you know, so, so we're sort of this, this, we're in this tension, right? Where, where there are demands for, from following, about following Jesus, demands placed on us by following Christ. And this desire that, that we have that we, we be a welcoming community uh, in the name of Jesus uh, and, and that we demonstrate Christ's love. And sometimes I think we're struggling with where we fall uh, on that continuum or on that, you know, on, on that, that line. You know, how do we on that spectrum, you know, how do we, and, and I think we sometimes view it as a spectrum. Uh, you know, the more, uh, the, the more, the uh, more, the more we focus on the demands of discipleship, uh, the less on this side, the less welcoming and, and supportive we can be on this side. So it's like we sort of see it, you know, as a slider going from one extreme to the other. Um, and, and, and so I wonder if we're sort of operating maybe with the wrong uh, perspective on that. So I want to spend a little time, I, I, I in the two weeks we've been uh, away, um, I've been doing some reading, I've been doing some research, and, 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 um, and, and just a couple of things have come up that I think are worth maybe discussing in this class. Um, and, and so I want to start today, in what may seem like a strange place, but as we talk about being this kind of community that's welcoming to people, um, but also very Christian, very distinctively Christian, um, this this is something that, that maybe we can start to 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 use to to deal with with what we perceive as this tension uh, and it's it's something Jesus said and and perhaps that's always a good place to start right uh, as Christians let's start with what Jesus says and let's go from there so um, you can turn in your Bibles we're going to look at two uh, texts and we're just going to look at them back to back and then talk about them and, and kind of go from there uh, one is Matthew nine ten through thirteen. And then one is Matthew 12, 1 to 17. Matthew 9, 10 to 13. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 12, 1 to 7, not 17. Um, and um, and I, I want to just start with, with those, those texts. Um, so Matthew 9, uh, starting in verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so keep that in your, your mind for a moment, and, and then let's go to Matthew 12, verse 1. Matthew 12, verse 1. 
At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on, Sab on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Um, so so what, do you, what do you notice about those two passages? Anything stand out to you in particular? I know. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Diane. No, Pam. Having okay. mercy. Having mercy. Okay. Yeah. There's there's this this reference to mercy, not sacrifice. Anybody know where that comes from? If you got a cross reference in your Bible, you can probably tell me. Uh, from the book of Hosea. Uh, it, Jesus is quoting scripture there. Um, and twice in the book of Matthew, and this is kind of interesting, sometimes sometimes what is, uh, as, as you compare, everybody knows, I think, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot of similarities. There's a lot of language that's the same. And there's a lot of, uh, of, of borrowing of material back and forth. And so, um, so sometimes you have, you know, episodes that look very similar in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or in two of the three. Um, twice, though, Matthew takes something from that, that's in Mark, uh, and, he, and, and it's almost word for word in Mark and in Matthew the same, except Matthew adds twice uh, in two of those episodes this reference to Hosea 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's like he wants to uh, to, to in, emphasize this. He wants to include this. He wants to, 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 to drop this into a couple of places. Um, and, and in doing so, it really kind of brings some emphasis to this, this idea of, as you said, Pam, what does Jesus emphasize? He emphasizes mercy. And what does he de-emphasize? He de-emphasizes sacrifice. And, and that's, that's kind of Interesting. And Hosea does this. It, it, it's, it's from Hosea again. Um, and, and in Hosea, it has to do, it's chapter 6, uh, verse 6, I think it is. It has to do with uh, wanting people, bringing a message, a prophetic message that, uh, that, that people who think they can cover unrighteousness and injustice and, and selfishness and violence and, and that sort of thing, that they can cover all that by going to the temple and offering sacrifices, they're badly mistaken. Because what God is interested in is mercy, not sacrifice. Um, and, and if, you know, if, if the two conflict or if, if, if he can have only one of the two, it's mercy that he's going to want every time. Uh, he, he doesn't care about sacrifice if it's not accompanied by a life that's, that's given to mercy. Um, in, in Matthew 9, how is it used? Go back to Matthew 9 there. H how, does he, how does he use the, the, uh, the quote? What's going on? Well, G Jesus is responding to the uh, Pharisees' accusation that um, he's, uh, he's eating, he's associating with sinners. And that that is goes against the law, um, but then Jesus answers and says, <clears throat> "the the sick are the ones that need a doctor, not not those who are healthy." So he's he's saying that the the sinners are the ones who need uh, need his help uh, to I don't know what I guess be right with God. Um, and so 
he wants to associate with them rather than with the Pharisees who are content to just let them wallow in their sins. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that sums it up pretty well. The, the, the question, the criticism directed at the, at the disciples, interestingly, both times the criticism is directed at the disciples, but it's about Jesus. Um, and so, so uh, indirect, you know, it's maybe easier sometimes. So, so the, the Pharisees uh, turn this criticism on Jesus. He's eating with sinners. And Jesus, interestingly, quotes Hosea here. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, go and learn what this means. That's, that's really kind of a slam. You know, the, the, the Pharisees are the legal scholars. You know, they're the people who know the law, supposedly. So Jesus telling them to go and learn what this means is, is kind of a, a slap in the face. Um, but it, it, again, he's using this, this reference from Hosea, this quote from Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, to sort of uh, to explain or to kind of lay out his philosophy. This is the way I'm operating. I'm not operating on this notion that I got to keep pure. I've got to keep away from these unclean people. I'm operating on the, the assumption that, that God wants mercy, not sacrifice. And, and I'm operating on the assumption that it's the sick who need a doctor and not the, the healthy. So then Verse uh, uh, chapter twelve. Uh, turn there. Turn turn to that one. Chapter twelve in Matthew, one through seven. What's going on here? Well, it's the classic example, Patrick, of religious people messing up a good thing, like they sometimes <laughs> do. That's basically what's going on in both these passages, and uh, it's, I think it's good perspective. You know, keep that okay. in mind. <laughs> I like the way you said that. Religious people messing up a good thing. Uh, okay, yeah. So, um, uh, what's what's the what's the thing they're messing up? What's the thing the religious people are 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 messing up here? They're missing the spirit of the law. Okay, they're messing up. They're going with the letter instead of the spirit. Okay, the letter says what? What? Why is what? I mean, this seems like a strange thing to be upset about. Why is what the disciples are doing? Why is it wrong? They're working. They're, According they're to the, the Pharisees' tradition, they're working, right? They're they're plucking the heads of grain and they're and eating them, and and so they're harvesting. <laughs> and 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 you you can sort of laugh at that, you can sort of ridicule that, but I mean, that's that seemingly is the is the violation that's happening here. Um, and they're, they're, what they're implying is, sure, it's a small thing. They know it's a small thing. But what they're implying is, you know, if you're going to let this small thing slide here, what other stuff are you letting slide? You know, what other, what other violations of the law might there be? And so it, it, it winds up being this, this uh, accusation that, that the disciples, and Jesus included, um, are playing fast and loose with, with Scripture. So how does Jesus respond? Well, first of all, he reminds them of a biblical account. David and his companions, when they're on the run from Saul, they are hungry, they need something to eat, they go to the temple. And the priests, all the priests have to share is the consecrated bread that is not lawful for anybody but priests to eat. And the priests give them the consecrated bread, and, and David and his, his men uh, eat the bread. Um, and then what's the second example from the Bible? Well, it says that the priests in the temple do something on that day that is considered work, but they're not held, they're not held to the, the, that part of the law, I, d I don't know what it is that, that they're doing. The, but, um, you know, the, 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 the sacrifices that might be necessary or whatever, okay. you know, whatever might be necessary in the temple for priests to do, they don't take the Sabbath off. 
and, and say, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to do that because it's the Sabbath because that function is elevated to be more important than this Sabbath observance of not working. And so, uh, so the, the priests are not held liable or guilty for breaking the law. Uh, nor was David punished. And, and nor was David punished for what he did. In fact, the priests seem to think in this case, this is, this is acceptable. This is an acceptable use of the consecrated bread in this case. Yeah, because so, they were hungry. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> in that case, yeah. yeah. <laughs> President's over uh, being punished for something that uh, the body was in need of. It, it, it brings to mind uh, this account, and I think it's in Mark, where Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That might have been a different account, actually. But in any case, the, the idea that Jesus taught that the, 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 that human beings weren't created to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created to help human beings. And so, uh, so in, a, in, a, in a situation of a conflict between helping a human being and observing the Sabbath, you help the mm -hmm. human being. Right. Um, but here he quotes, again, this text from Hosea. I desire, if you had known what these words mean, again, smack in the face, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. Mercy, not sacrifice. Um, so those are two kind of categories that Jesus is playing with here, right? On, on the one hand, there's mercy. On the other hand, there's sacrifice. Um, now, here's the interesting thing, of course, or one of the interesting things. Um, the Pharisees, didn't. most of them, didn't really care what went on at the temple. They, they thought the temple long ago had been uh, compromised. Uh, as soon as the temple authorities started cozying up to the Romans or whoever, uh, they thought the temple had been compromised. Um, and so, so for them, temple worship wasn't a big deal. I'm sure they still offered sacrifices. I'm sure they still went to the temple and did the things they were supposed to do, but the temple wasn't their concern. For the Pharisees, what was the main concern? How did they, how did they think that a, a Jewish person is supposed to maintain his identity as a Jewish person? Keeping the law. Keeping the law, Josh says. Yes. The Pharisees were very concerned about keeping the law. That's why they developed all these rules and all these traditions around it. Uh, they felt that, so instead of worrying about what was happening at the altar in Jerusalem, well, their table was an altar to God. And so they were careful to follow the food laws, careful to, to, to carefully careful to carefully, uh, care, careful to, to uh, minutely make sure that, that they were remaining pure uh, and, and not unclean in, the, in their practices. So when, G, when they accuse Jesus of uh, eating with sinners, what they're saying is you're violating the sanctity of the table. You're violating the, the law by, by associating with these people, though the law doesn't really say that. Um, and, and in the case of, of working on the Sabbath, we're careful to make sure to define what working on the Sabbath looked like. And so when the disciples were picking those heads of grain, they were, they were violating the, the, the Pharisees category of, of sacrifice. That was the thing for them. Sacrifice wasn't so much putting the, offering on the altar, sacrifice was following the Torah, following the law, making sure that they were observing everything very carefully. Um, and even sort of bringing some of that, uh, some, of the, some of the purity laws that the Pharisees seemed to follow every day really seemed in the law to apply mostly to the priests and the Levites. But, but again, they were importing some of that into their normal lives so that uh, in this way, they could be seen as, as holding to their identity as Jews, even in a time when that might be difficult. Um, Patrick? Yeah. I hope none of us think that this has died out, because this has been going on for centuries. <laughs> and it's still going on today, 
I, I witnessed it in Skokie, Illinois. Some of my customers still practice this very thing, following things to the letter of the law. And to give you an example, they told me if I came to their house on Saturday, I'm fired. You know, they, they would not have anything going on in that house on Saturday except right. for religious observance. So I, I just want everybody to know this still goes on, <laughs> not too far from us. And and it does still go on not too far from us. And it can also go on uh, among Christians. And that's kind of what I want to get to as we as we as we're talking about this, because we're, you know, I, I'm not I, I Obviously, for us, the, the temple in Jerusalem is not an issue. Food laws and Sabbath laws aren't an issue. Uh, but, but for us, it can be so easy to, uh, to sort of continue this, this, this uh, pattern of creating our categories of what purity looks like. This is purity. This is what it looks like to be the people of God. This is what it looks like to be right with God. Some of those things we've talked about at length, perhaps in this class over the last few weeks, some of them we maybe leave unstated, um, but we, we can easily develop our own ideas. And I would argue we all do it. We all develop our ideas of what fits in the purity category. And what does it. Um, and, and, you know, it's easy to say, well, uh, people leave church because they don't love God enough to stay within our purity categories. I mean, that's, that's the easy thing to say, right? If only these people were more like us, if only they were as, as concerned as we are about, uh, about being righteous and, and being good and, and being Christian, then they would stay. Um, and certainly it's true that people like all of us, we, we find there are interesting things out there in the world that don't fit so well in, with life and church. But, but maybe, maybe if we're taking Jesus seriously here, then maybe what we're doing is setting people up for failure. We're setting people up for feelings of shame and inadequacy by communicating that what God cares about is sacrifice, our purity categories, whatever those might be, uh, and, and less about mercy. Um, the Pharisees were making the same mistake, right, that, that had been made in the days of the prophets. They were elevating sacrifice over caring for human need, including the need for righteousness, the need, for, the need to, to eat, uh, they were they were elevating their categories over caring for human need, and and I I don't think we're free of that temptation, and I think some of the the the, the reasons that people have given in the books we've taken a look at in in the surveys we've looked at I think some of the reasons people have given maybe indicate this clash that that we've. We've lost sight sometimes that what God wants is mercy and not sacrifice. Now, let me, let me get out of the way this, this statement. Um, it's not that purity is unimportant to Jesus. But it's not the primary way that Jesus understood his mission. And it's not the primary way Jesus understood God. Um. <clears throat> Mercy is sort of a big umbrella category for the way the kingdom of God works. Uh, if there's a conflict in Jesus' eyes and in, 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 his, in his ministry, you see it all the time. If there's a conflict between mercy and sacrifice, what wins? If there's a conflict between mercy and purity, which one wins? I think we know the answer to that question, right? Over and over again, Jesus demonstrates mercy. Mercy. You know, over and over again, that's that's the that's the the leading edge, I guess, uh, of his of his work in the world. Um, some of the things that we've talked about, like overprotectiveness and hostility toward questions and doubts and intolerance toward outsiders and exclusivity, maybe what people who are leaving are perceiving 
is that we're protecting our purity categories instead of offering mercy. And again, I don't think, I don't think we can avoid the fact that we're going to have these categories. I think what we have to learn is how to, to, to live with that while showing, while leading over and over again with mercy. And I think sometimes we get it right, and, and I think sometimes we don't. Um, the thing is, I think, I, I think Jesus actually thinks that you get more out of people when, when you lead with mercy. At least that's the way he operates. You, you get more out of people when you lead not with shame or, or fear that, that, that a, a purity code might get broken, but, but you lead with mercy. And, and people often respond to that with um, paradoxically more righteousness, more love, more kindness, more compassion and mercy of their own. Um, I'm talking a lot. Let me, let me stop there. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I had one thought, um, had to do with, um, why, why, um, a person, this person, uh, uh, come to our church, but then they leave because they don't take the time to understand under not a ritual, but understand how we conduct our service. And a lot of people don't understand that because there are some churches that only have communion once a month. We do it every week. Um, no instrumental music. And so people leave for that reason also. They just don't, they don't, they don't stick around long enough to, uh, to, to learn why we do it the way we do it. So, so I mean, in a situation like that, what, what would mercy uh, drive us to do? Try to, try to reach out and bring them back. Right. Uh, offer um, a Bible study or something. Okay. What else might, what else in a situation like that, what else might mercy push us to do in, 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 with a, with a in, in the case of a person who's who's struggling with the way we do this this thing or that thing. Well, a lot of times I think our attitude in, in, in how we present to people makes a difference as to whether or not they will even listen to us, much less come back. I think it's important that we show our own grace, our own um, caring about their point of view. A lot of people have arrived at that point of view after being taught by their parents, or after being going to Bible classes themselves and just being taught errantly. I think that we, we have to show compassion, but they need to feel like we're not so arrogant as to say, you, we're the only ones going to heaven, you're going to hell, and if you don't change. It, it, has to, it has to come from a place of love that shows that God loves us and we demonstrate his grace towards that person. Well, and in your example, or um, the, the example that was given, we could always go to that person and say, oh, you know, if weekly communion is sort of new to you or you're uncomfortable with that, feel free to take it just once a month. I mean, there is some ambiguity in the Bible as to when communion should be taken, and most Catholics would tell you that you should take it at least daily, and they will point to a passage in Acts where it says the, the apostles met daily uh, for the breaking of bread. Um, you don't have to admit that you think that's the best, but wouldn't that be a better option to have him taking communion with us some? Um, and then over time, maybe he gets more comfortable with it, and all of a sudden now he's taking it, you know, every other week. Or, or, or the like. Um, maybe you just have to get like, where we are right. instantly, right? Yeah, I mean, it, the fact is, 
and, and if you actually sat down and thought about it instead of hammering with him, if he's uncomfortable with it, he maybe shouldn't be taking right. communion because there's supposed to be some kind of preparation uh, for, for that and, and, and the like, you know? Um, yeah. I, I, just two other thoughts pretty quick. Well, um, let, me get, let me get Josh's okay. response and then sure. I'll come back to sure. you. What were you gonna say, Josh? Yeah, I mean, just along the same lines, we talked about pulling people back. Jesus, in the passages we read, he didn't, he didn't pull. He, he let them pull. Maybe that's the wrong. He went, he went with them. He, he met them where they were. You know, he went to the house of the tax collectors. He didn't say, you've got to come to the temple because that's how, um, that, that, that's how we do things. He went to their houses and he ate with them, even though it cost him a lot of social capital among the religious people of the day. And was one of the things that cost him his life eventually. I nothing is more important than um, reaching someone's heart, mm-hmm. um, and if it means, you know, setting your pride aside for just a few a few precious minutes or a few hours, um, or being a part of something that you don't necessarily um, agree with one hundred percent, it's it, if, if it's for the purposes of spreading God's word um, and um, reaching someone's heart, it's worth it. Okay, uh, Ron, you, you said you had a couple more points. You yeah, to... yeah, just just quick on the on the passage of the disciples um, walking through the field. I, I think it's probably instructive there to realize that the Pharisees thought this was clear. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they thought it was clear. You know, what, what are they doing when they take a grain and they shell it and then they eat it? Well, not only are they eating, they are threshing and, and harvesting. It's obvious to, and harvesting. And it's obvious to anyone that that's work. Um, and they got it wrong, apparently. Um, and even if they didn't get it wrong, Jesus suggests the reaction should have been mercy to the situation and not such a big concern as to the letter. But I personally, I think they got it wrong. Um, I don't think that was the intent of the law to stop the activity that the, the disciples were doing there. I, I don't think Jesus would have probably let them do it if it, if it had truly been a sin um, in, in God's eyes. So, I mean, I think that's cautionary for us that sometimes we think something is so clear and, and then we get confronted by somebody who says, I don't think it's clear at all. And, and we're not willing to try to broaden our scope to, to relate to them and, and recognize that what we think is clear as, as anything um, really might not be. Um, the second thing is um, you were talking about our purity code and stuff. Um, and, you know, this, this isn't going to be persuade anyone because of the, the source, but it was just in the news uh, a little bit ago. Patrick probably knows where I'm going because um, it had a very amusing translation in one of the uh, newspapers. Um, Pope says sexy sins aren't the worst. Um, <laughs> and I love that sexy sins. Um, um, that's not exactly probably the best translation. And and basically, oh, though, what he said was <laughs> sins of the flesh are not the most serious. And, and not to say that they weren't sins. He said they are sins. But he was much more concerned spiritually about hatred and pride um, and, and, and the like. Um, and by the way, it, it's not just the Pope. C.S. Lewis and other Christian writers have come to a similar um, conclusion, which sort of upends what I think a lot of people, how people would, would rank things. So I think we do have our priorities set out, um, whether they're culture or how we grow up or this, that, or the other. But sometimes I think we really have to look at those and, and make sure that those priorities, it, it, it's hard to foist our priorities necessarily on somebody else. Um, you know, it might be better that they focus on pride or hatred or, or, or things like that. Those may be the most pressing concerns of that particular person. 
Um, and, and those may be more of a spiritual threat. Not to say that the Pope said that sex outside of marriage was fine, he didn't. But again, the purity code thing, oftentimes I think our congregations have been quite happy to tolerate people who hate one another and are very proud of themselves. But somebody commits a sexual misdeed and all of a sudden they're out. Um, that may not be the right way of, of looking at things. So anyway, that's it. So yeah, I, the, the um, and, and again, we, we get into this thing where it's, you know, it's mercy on the one hand or, you know, righteousness or holiness on the other side of the slider. And, and I don't think Jesus saw it that way. Again, I think he thinks you get more holiness, you get more righteousness, you, you, you help people uh, come to God more consistently with mercy as the operative principle. Um, and, and because that's how God operates. I mean, that's right. We see that over and over again in the Bible, right? It's hard to miss that as the big picture of Scripture. God operates out of mercy over and over again. God operates out of mercy. He shows that time and time again through the story of Israel, through the story of, of Jesus, church, time and time again, it's, it's mercy is the operative principle. Uh, and, and so Jesus is just sort of showing us how that looks in life and, and in our world. Um, and, and that does not mean that that we that mercy is overlooking wrongdoing. Um, sometimes that's not merciful at all. Jesus did not overlook wrongdoing. He did not ignore it. Um, he did not just pretend it didn't exist. Uh, mercy acknowledges that human beings sin, that we do wrong, that when we do, it impacts the larger community often. It has consequences. It has ripples. Uh, mercy recognizes all of that, but uh, mercy does not make a person's worst day um, the sole determiner of that person's value. Mercy says you're, you're, you're more than your worst day. You're, 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 you're more than the mistakes you've made. Uh, and, and in the mistakes you've made, God loves you right in the middle of those and, and cares about you right in the middle of those. Um, there are times to establish boundaries, but it's probably not uh, <laughs> in, in a conversation with a person who's just starting to, to, to try to find their way to Jesus or find their way back to Jesus. Uh, that's probably not the time to begin talking immediately about, you know, what are the boundaries and how do we exclude and, and who gets left out. Um, and and However it's happened, some people who have perhaps even grown up in church have come to this idea that we care more about the purity categories than we care about them. And why in the world would they bother with us if that's the case? Um, Patrick? Yes. It's Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi. I didn't mean, I, I might have interrupted you. I didn't mean to. No, no, it's fine. One of the things that, I, I don't know if I'll regret bringing this up or not, but um, one of the things that's been kind of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say bothering me, but kind of a thought that's been lurking in the back of my head is how most of our conversations have been and in this it has been about how we know what the Bible says and we know what's right and how much should we give, allow, show mercy on versus where we need to be very clear and, 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 and draw our lines. And I think the thing that concerns me a little bit is which of us get to be those line drawers a little bit. And I'm not sure, because I think, I think some of what we're saying is, of course, we have to approach these things with love. And of course, we have to let people know they're important. 
but we still have to clearly show the lines. And I'm not saying there aren't bound boundaries. I'm saying some of those lines are not as clear as we think they are, kind of like some of the things Ron was mentioning, but I'm not sure, I think, I think a lot of people are not just, they know that we love them on some level, but I'm not sure unless we say, maybe I can learn something from you and maybe you can learn something from me that we're really gonna get where we wanna be. Yeah. And I think we should be willing to learn from an 18 year old or a 20 year old. Yeah. You know, a lot of people aren't used to some of the issues with working with, you know, gay people, for example. I'm not saying where we land on that. I think that should be a discussion. I don't mean that we have to say anything goes, but I think people should be allowed to have discussions on both sides of those issues or anywhere in the middle. But we can at least learn how people are perceived by the younger crowd, if nothing else, without first having to define where the boundaries are. I'm not sure I'm saying what I mean very well, but unless we're willing to do a give and take, a lot of people are gonna kind of see right through our conversations about how much we love them. If we say, I love you, but you know, I'm gonna keep working until you believe what I believe, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure that's what is meant. I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's what these, these passages suggest. It's not like, well, you know, eventually you'll see that we're really not supposed to do these things. But again, I'm not saying anyone should change their own views about right and wrong. I'm saying we should listen and be willing to learn and contemplate some of these things. And anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I... I, 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 I th and I think, I mean, that's one of the things I've been, I'm, I'm trying to, to work through with, with this idea of mercy and not sacrifice, that, that the operative category is mercy. And by that, I mean, I don't just mean, you know, this sort of, um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? This, uh, uh, this, this, this humoring of people or, you know, this, you know, well, you know, uh, I've got it right, and you'll get here eventually. I, I don't, I don't, that's not really the kind of mercy I'm talking about. I don't think it's the kind of mercy Jesus is talking about. Mercy is the leading edge. Mercy, mercy is, is the way through which we relate to everything else. Uh, you ask about, about lines. Um, I, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that, that what we ought to be doing is looking toward Jesus Kind of gathering around him, <laughs> and 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 let that be, you know, it's it's less boundaries and it's more center of gravity is what I'm saying. Uh, if if we can all sort of cluster around Jesus, then whether we're right in the middle or sort of out on the fringes, if we're still sort of you know orbiting him, then then perhaps we're on to something. And and if we can then treat one another with mercy in that reality, then, then, then maybe, maybe we're onto something there. Um, and I think you're right. I, I don't, I, I, I think for the church, what we ought to be doing is learning from each other. Um, the church has a long history. Uh, the church has a long history of a lot of things. Let me say up front, some good, some bad. The church has a long history of authoritarian practices that never work well, that never go well, that never lead to flourishing, that never lead to people growing. It, it leads to, uh, to pain and, and stunted spiritual growth and, and it leads to disaster. Um, authoritarian isn't what we need. Um, and, 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 and what Jesus tells us is the way we interact with the world and with one another it's mercy. That's the operative category. And, and we can work through the differences. We can, we can deal. And, and I mean, I know you've all seen it. I know you've all seen situations in which people who don't agree about something very important can still love one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus. Because usually it's because we know each other well, and we know each other's hearts, and we know 
And so it's easier to show mercy. Mercy can cost you something sometimes. Mercy can be hard because it, 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 it requires some uncomfortable things. But it, it's, it's the way Jesus tells us to relate. And, and so I, I agree with what you're saying, Christy. I, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm, I'm just sort of moving the slider one way or the other. I, 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 I think that the way Jesus frames mercy here, it's supposed to be what, what goes through everything so that people are, are free to, uh, to, to uh, come to know the Lord's mercy, come to know his love, come to receive uh, forgiveness of their sins and, and, and can grow and can prosper and can, uh, can understand more deeply what it is to, to follow Jesus. Um, and and I, I think that's, that's certainly the way Jesus, think about the G, way Jesus relates to his disciples. Um, <laughs> I mean, how patient would you be with some of those guys? <laughs> right? Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I mean, how patient would you be with some of them? And yet, and now sometimes, sometimes Jesus gets frustrated with them, and sometimes he, he speaks kind of harshly to them in some ways. But there's never a question about whether, you know, you know, whether you're invited to come back tomorrow, you know, that's, that, that's always there. Jesus is always, you know, gathering them back to himself and teaching and, and trying to help them learn from their failures and pick themselves up and, and, and move forward. And, and, and I just think that's a, a great model for the kind of community we're talking about. Um, and it's not a, it's not a, an empty, you know, live and let live kind of tolerance. And it's not an empty, you know, I don't even want to know what you're doing kind of tolerance. It's, it's, it's a grace and it's a mercy that invites people in and, and invites them in where they are. And, and so, yeah, uh, I, somebody else had a comment or. One of the things that I'm surprised about when I read about Jesus's interactions is how often the people that were sure they knew what he was about were wrong. Yeah. Ones that said most clearly that they were certain and the ones that were really exploring with him were often the ones complimented or the ones that got the most out of their interactions. And I think sometimes we maybe need to be a little bit more surprised by what Jesus might do in a situation instead of bringing to the situation what we're sure Jesus would say or do. I think that might apply even today. If, if you think you know, <laughs> you know, if you, if, if you think Jesus just sort of, uh, um, if you think you always know what he's, what he would think or what he would do or what he would say, uh, you'll probably be surprised <laughs> uh, because we, we do tend to sort of, uh, Jesus, Jesus kind of can be the world's greatest spokesmodel, right? Because he can, we, we can sort of make him be all about the things we care about and, and, and just sort of ignore the places where he challenges us. And I think the church does that fairly, yeah. fairly regularly. Yeah. I think of the, I, I see myself in the guy who comes to Jesus and says, uh, you know, Master, we saw uh, a guy casting out demons in your name, and we, but don't worry, we stopped him because he's not one of us. And Jesus goes, You did what? <laughs> you stopped him. <laughs> Why would you stop him? Um, and and, and I, I see myself there because somebody doesn't fit the categories that I think, you know, and, and I can easily go into protective mode. Yeah, Patrick, I think the, yeah, I think the problem is that we don't want to be in, in the situation where we look like we are tolerating or um, accepting sin. Um, we find that objectionable and we can always look to Paul and the man who was married to the, you know, a, a, which by the way was a pretty extreme example, uh, pr pretty, pretty extreme issue and stuff. And, and, and so we feel like if I, if I don't tell them um, and come down on them, 
about all of these kinds of things that I see that's wrong, that are wrong with their lives. And, and if I don't face them with it, um, then somehow I'm complicit in it or, or I haven't done my job or the like, or, or they're going to sully um, you know, the church in, in, in some way. Um, and I, first of all, the idea of sullying the church suggests that somehow that these people are sinful and we're not, which is, a, you know, the whole joke about the unrighteous versus the righteous in, in the New Testament, which is there anyone who is righteous? Well, no. But secondly, as you've been pointing out, and, and as the Pharisees clearly noticed, Christ surrounded himself with sinful people. Um, so, it, 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 again, if we're looking to Christ as our model, his, his approach to those things seems to have been love um, most of the time. He, he didn't try to separate himself from those kinds of things. Um, and, and now, did he always, if direct, asked directly, did he explain his thought? He didn't necessarily. My point is just having those people amongst us does not somehow taint us because the church is supposed to have those people. Christ reached out to those people um, and, and, and sought those people. Christ and God love those people. Um, so again, back to what you were saying, I, I think oftentimes the message that people get is one of condemnation and the condemnation is not the gospel. Um, the love is the gospel and, and we all have issues um, and some of them are hard and I, I'm beginning more and more to realize that sometimes you just have to let realize that some of these issues may take a while and it may be a way down their walk with God that they even realize there's an issue there um, to confront it because there's always something else out there that you realize. Um, the, the goal seems to be to get them to have that relationship with Christ and God and then we can let Christ and God take care of those revelations and those realizations and that transforming um kind of thing so anyway so. yeah so so uh Zacchaeus comes to mind um and and we had we have tax tax collectors in our in our uh Matthew 9 text but but tax collectors uh, uh, but, uh, Zacchaeus comes to mind um mercy not sacrifice uh, well and Matthew may like to this passage quite a bit right absolutely. you were pointing about the the passage that Matthew inserts well that may have spoken to him, absolutely, right? <laughs> uh, Zacchaeus, you know, I, I, I want to see Jesus. I, I just want to see it. I don't even know why. I just, I just want to climb up this tree, and I want to see it. And Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. Not to wherever he was staying. He goes to the tax collector's house, and he eats with the tax collector and whoever else would eat with it. And, and they sit down around the table and they have a meal. And at the end of the meal, Zacchaeus says, I give, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give half, half of what I have, I can't remember the numbers, half of what I have to the poor and I'm going to uh, restore uh, anybody who I've ripped off, I think it's four times. Uh, he comes to this moment, not because Jesus, you know, sits down with him and, and tells him, tells him off, but because he shows him mercy. And, and, and because of that, he can see God and he can see his response and he can see what he needs to do. And Jesus says, this man too is a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to this house. And that's huge. If you, if, you don't, if you don't know how huge that is, because you've heard that story a million times, that is huge. That, he's, he, that he shows that mercy and Zacchaeus comes to that conclusion. Um, now, we always get to this, <laughs> you know, 
but it, it really isn't. There are times when, when, when lines have to be drawn. There are times when boundaries have to be drawn, but I think it's very rare. And I think it's, it's, it, and it's something that the whole church does. And it's not something that we do just because we're uncomfortable or we're tired of dealing with it. And, and it's something that's done uh, in the end for the good of, of this. But I, I heard that, I read this story uh, and I don't know how true it is, but, but it was presented as true. Uh, a, a, a church, a, 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 one of our churches uh, d decided they were going to disfellowship like 50 people who hadn't been to church in uh, three years, maybe. And, and so they had this list of people that were going to send them letters to disfellowship them, or just they were going to disfellowship them somehow. And somebody said, how would they know? And the elders kind of got together and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, go visit all these people and try to get them to come back to church and then uh, and then just fellowship the ones who won't. So they'll know. So they go and they, they visit all these people. Uh, three or four of them have died or have moved away and nobody knew. Um, every other one came back. <laughs> every other one came back. They wound up just fellowshipping nobody because everybody else came back. Um, I would stipulate to you that maybe if in that case people had been thinking about mercy and not sacrifice, that whole strange journey could have been avoided. Um, and, and look, I know this makes, makes us uncomfortable sometimes. It does me too. But that's what Jesus does. He makes us uncomfortable sometimes. And I, I think we just got to let that lie and, and sit with that. Um, because we've got to be a, a kind of community if we want to, to be a place where people don't leave <laughs> and, and, when they, and, 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 and where people can come back, we've got to be a kind of community that emphasizes mercy, that operates on this principle of mercy. And, and we've got to figure out how that works. Um, okay, um, thank you very much. We've got to stop. I'm late. Um, uh, next week, I, I, uh, I, I have a little something planned. I haven't ironed it out entirely yet. We'll see how it goes. Uh, it may be that, it may be something else. But uh, anyway, thank you for your, your thoughts and your, your comments. And, uh, and I, I think, you know, let's keep talking about and, and praying about being this kind of, of community that we're, we're, we're looking at, where mercy is the operative principle. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a great week. Good you too. Good night, good night everybody. Yeah, have a good week. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Stay warm. Yeah. Amen.